All right, all right. Hooligans. Uh, Chuck, can you summarize again what you had already well, said? Well, I would huh. say probably like a shepherd or an overseer. Okay, that's enough from you. Uh, what, can you just say what you said, but like kind of just say it, you know. Without. Again. I didn't say that? Okay. Pretend like you didn't and just repeat what you had already said. Well, they are there to lead the church. They are to help them, uh, to teach them, to help them to um, grow and to oversee things that the church is doing. And when you say and lead, keep, what do you mean? <laughs> well, like, in the direction that they need to go. Okay. Um, lead as an example in the way that they live their life. And I had something else, but I forgot it. Close enough. Overall, I give you a B for your repeating skills. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> uh, now, I think it was Grace who was saying something, right? Um, to add on to what he said, um, um, to correct him as well. Okay. Um, and to help out with disputes and such. And then um, to dispute false uh, doctrine when okay. it comes up in the church. Um, and all of what Chuck and I said pretty much sums up in Second Timothy 4, 1 through 5. Oh, and I... I Where now? Second Timothy 4, 1 through 5. Okay. What were you going to say, Chuck? To unify them. Mm. That's what I had forgotten. Second Timothy 4, 1 through 5 says this, I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing in his kingdom... Preach the word, be ready in season and out of season, reprove, rebu rebuke, and exhort with com uh, complete patience and teaching. Uh, for the time is coming when people will not endure sound uh, teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions, and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. As for you, always be sober-minded, endure suffering to the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. You said through five, right? Yeah. Excuse me? Okay. Anybody else or any other ideas? Just on the pastor part or the church part? On the pastor part, specifically the pastor part. Oh. When you guys think about a pastor, what 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 do you think? What what makes a good pastor to you? Nicole? Oh, you're eating. I'm sorry. Somebody that'll listen if you, mm -hmm. need, you need to talk to them about something. Okay. It's like, okay. All right. Diana, what, what, what makes a good pastor to you? What do you look for in a pastor? Um, I think it's uh, teaching and also living an example. Okay. You know. Important things. Ben? I look for someone who's bald, has glasses, and walks around the pulpit taking off his glasses frequently during the sermon. Wait, can he just be bald back here? Yes. Can yes, he can. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. Ben? <laughs> what makes a good pastor? Or, what do you look for in a pastor? I'll come back to you. Gracie, what do you look for in a pastor? Um, someone that really studies the word, and you can tell they okay. study the word, especially when you're talking to them. They're able to, you ask them a question, they're able to know exactly where to find the answer, you know? Right. And then also uh, someone that's the same on the pulpit in, in church as they are at home. Mm. A transparent person. Yeah. Gotcha. Chuck? Um, I think one thing is uh, someone who actually cares about the people in the church and the community mm -hmm. and isn't just like, just 
cares about their little center. Right. You know, but actually branches out and cares for people outside of what their personal boundaries or that mm -hmm. are. I, I heard it said <clears throat> once that uh, of, of pastors that, that your congregation will never care how much you know unless they know how much you care. I think I said that right, and that's pretty much uh, what what Chuck was just saying. Um, ben. Um, well, like uh, the, the uh, you know, Randall's been preaching about um, like uh, the the fate and stuff. Yeah. And um, I was telling him that I don't think I've personally ever heard a pastor acknowledge that there's people that fake gifts in the spirit. So, yeah. And I think that. And, and then I, I think there's a couple of reasons for that, and one is that they don't want to chase people off, you know? Mm -hmm. And so I think the willingness, willingness to lose people um, for the truth, you know, mm -hmm. is, is important. And also um, the ability to, when the time comes to, you know, step down and, and let go of the church so mm -hmm. that you can, you know, let, not try to hold on to it because it's not your church. Right, right. Huh. I sure hope the recording picked that up, because th those are some thought-provoking answers. Okay, um, got lost in uh, what you guys were saying. I actually forgot where I was going with that. Uh, <laughs> let me... Uh, okay, so do you guys think that your idea of, of what you look for in a pastor, would you say that those are things that, that the Bible itself affirms, or that it doesn't mention, or that... Maybe it doesn't really talk about what, what. What do you guys think? Well, um, my opinion. My sister-in-law one time told me because my brother is a pastor in the uh -huh. church, and she was telling me she's like after church, how he has the patience to listen to everybody's little problem, <laughs> and she's like, "There's no way I can do that." <laughs> and she's like, she, he will just sit there for hours and listen to them. And she's like, I would, I would like trying to like find ways to get out of it. You know? <laughs> yeah. and, and, and at I'm least she's honest. It, and I'm like, wow. I said, that's an amazing gift right. as a pastor. And you know, when you have a call from God to be as a pastor, God is looking in those qualities. Right. Like, they're gonna be able to do that, mm. this or that. You know, just just to serve. Even if you have just a little bit of everything to yeah. serve different people in church, I think that's a good quality of how God would choose a pastor mm -hmm. to lead, you know, right. people in church, you know. Yeah. I don't know. I kind of, like, opened my eyes a little bit, like, wow, you know, it's, it's amazing how, right. you know, pastors are chosen from God, you know. Yeah. So. Good answer, yeah. What do you guys think? Are your are your expectations, you know, do they do they match up or? I think for the most part that they do. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Did you guys hear any ideas going out that you thought maybe didn't really match up with with what you read in the Bible? And if so, why? Not really. No. no. Okay. Good. Well, I mean. Go ahead. I want to say, like in, in my country, we had some pretty weird pastors. <laughs> what do you mean? We do in our country, too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you don't have the monopoly on that. <laughs> Ours just get on TV. Well, from a different background as a Baptist, you know, now I look back and I'm like, how is a pastor even chosen to be a pastor? You know, because, I mean, you can tell by the way he presents himself, by the way he treats people, by the way he preaches in church, you're like, how in the world did he pass the test? <laughs> for me, I, he wouldn't even get like a 1% vote. <laughs> you know, yeah. and, and you're like, oh my gosh, you're embarrassing the church. Not, you know, <laughs> I don't know where I was going with that. I'm trying not to laugh. Sometimes you're like... So was that even in God's plan? You know. We got a mistake here, guys. <laughs> Do a recall. <laughs> like they say on Blind Cow, you're doing it wrong. <laughs> Sorry, I don't know where I was going with that. I missed it. Um, 
rest of my... <laughs> Who cares? It was funny anyways. <laughs> I don't even care what your point was. That was funny. <laughs> okay. So let's look at the job of the pastor. <clears throat> One of the important things to note whenever you're um, whenever you're talking about the roles of pastors is to mention that in the New Testament, oftentimes it'll talk more about the character of a pastor than it will actually his his job responsibilities. Mm -hmm. You know, and I think that that's not a mistake. I think that that is the focus and the heart of a pastor is is who he is. You know. Um, well, yeah, and so with the with the things that, that pastors are called, um, two two definite or two descriptions that I think have kind of lost um, their importance in the modern setting is the idea first off as a pastor as an overseer. Now an overseer, Chuck mentioned this. An overseer is someone who watches over something, who who guides something. See what I mean? And in today's church, in today's American church especially, we have the idea of, of pastors as entertainers. You know what I mean? They're supposed to, we come we come on Sunday mornings and, and they do their routine so that we can go home and live our lives. See what I mean? It's not really um, a cohesion system so much as a, I'm paying you for your service so you do your thing so that I can go home and do my thing. See what I mean? And, and that's not really the biblical idea of a pastor. The biblical idea of a pastor is an overseer. that He's helping you go out and serve the Lord. So I mean, not helping you so that you don't have to do devotionals. You don't have to seek after God. You don't have to do anything. You just kind of live your little life. And here's God in his box, and here's you in, your, in yours. You know what I mean? And uh, I think that, that losing that title for a pastor has, has, has in some ways encouraged that idea of a pastor. But then the second one is the pastor as a shepherd. Now... I'm refraining from telling any sheep jokes, <laughs> but um, but when you think about a pastor as a shepherd, he's someone who takes care of them. He's someone who guard who guards against intruders. Uh, somebody mentioned about um, false doctrine. I think it was Gracie, yeah. and uh, that's kind of, that, that's that's something that a shepherd would do, keeping the wolves away. You know, um, making sure that the sheep don't get lost, making sure that they don't wander off into a danger. You know. And I think that when we remember those two titles for a pastor, overseer and shepherd, we kind of have a have a um, what's it called um, wrap up, I guess, of what you could, you could say of, of of what the pastor is. Uh, conclusion. A what am I? What's the word I'm looking for? Um, summarization. <laughs> summarization. <laughs> um, so the first thing that. Uh, I want to kind of guide to light here in the job of the pastor is prayer. James 5, uh, 14 says, Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. Also in Acts it mentions about, um, and I'll read this in just a little bit, um, have the, have the base, I'm, I'm paraphrasing here, have the elders take care of this so that we can dedicate ourselves to prayer. And I, it, obviously, prayer was a very important aspect of the job of the pastor's job. I mean, look at the way about the how the early apostles were in the upper room praying until the Holy Spirit was given. How all throughout Acts, the prayer is is so strongly um, um, emphasized on. For instance, before they replaced Judas's place on the twelve, they were in prayer, and after prayer, they made a decision. They were in prayer when the Holy Spirit came. They were in prayer when Saul was called into ministry. And his name was changed to Paul. Uh, they were in prayer. See what I mean? All throughout Acts, prayer is a key focus of things happening. In fact, in Acts, you see very few things happening apart from prayer. You know, and um, I think that Luke was emphasizing that because prayer is a very important aspect, not just for pastors but also for the church as a whole. So then the same thing is preaching and teaching. Um, these are these are slightly different. Um, but, I mean, I just included them into the same thing to just avoid confusion altogether. Uh, Acts chapter 6, verse 2. And the twelve uh, summoned the full number of the disciples and said, It is not right that we should give up preaching the word of God to serve tables. Therefore, brothers, pick out from among you seven men of good repute, full of the Spirit and of wisdom, whom we will appoint uh, to this duty, verse 4, but we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. 
So obviously right there we've got two main focuses, prayer and the, and the preaching of the word. So uh, good character, and, and I'm just mentioning a few verses here. I mean there's a lot more that I could I could reference. Three or four different places in the New Testament specifically talk, talk about the character of a pastor. Um, Titus 1.7. Um, and as I'm reading these things, I, I hope you guys see how how you guys were, were really on target with your with your answers. Um, for an overseer, excuse me, as God's steward must be above reproach. <clears throat> excuse me, he must not be arrogant or quick tempered or a drunkard or violent or greedy for gain. And it goes on, hospitable, uh, lover of good, self controlled, and it goes on there. But the idea here is, is the good character that the pastor is supposed to possess. Uh, prevent false teachings. I think Gracie said this, yeah. and uh, I think that 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 is one of the uh, foundational things. Remember, sh pastor is shepherd. First Timothy, um, one three. As I urged you when I was going to Macedonia, remain at Ephesus so that you may charge certain persons not to teach any different doctrine. Now, Timothy. I don't, we don't really know how long he was a pastor at Ephesus, but this is basically what happened. Paul was on his way somewhere, and so he put Paul, Timothy, um, at Ephesus to, to find people to be, the, to be pastors. And then eventually he went and met back up with Paul before he died in Rome. Um, and we don't really know if he stayed on at Ephesus with those other pastors or if he went somewhere else. We really don't know. But that was Tim both Timothy and Titus's job, was to, to find the right people for the, for, for the uh, job and then to train them up uh, so that they would then go pastoring the congregations and raising up other people to continue the work of the ministry. Um, so. um, and then be an example. Someone else also mentioned this in Hebrews... Uh, 1317 not too far obey your leaders and submit to them for they are keeping watch over your souls as those who will get have to give an account let them do this with joy and not with groaning for that would be of no advantage to you um, obviously once again they're about about being an example and all that stuff so Oh, and then Matthew eighteen seventeen talks about this. I don't really want to get into this, but uh, somebody mentioned it um, about concluding um, escalated events. Basically, what people do is as soon as there's a there's a slightest disagreement in the church, they instantly take it to the pastor. What they're actually supposed to do is actually try. They sh are supposed to try and reconcile the situation with that person, um, and then if somebody is wrong, you know, to try and correct them in the situation. And then if they don't listen, then try and you know other methods and whatnot and then as the escalated form it goes to the le church leadership it's not supposed to be the first thing that it goes to the church leadership We're, we'll talk about church discipline next week um, but I think that that's really important to emphasize because a lot of times in church conflict people want to instantly cop out by throwing it at the pastor but that's not the pastor's job <laughs> you know what I mean a lot of things nowadays that people put on the pastor is not even biblical I mean honestly um, so let's look at the church member, and, and you'll kind of see what I'm talking about. Um, in Hebrews 10.32, it says, But recall the former days when after you were enlightened, you endured a hard struggle with su uh, sufferings. Sometimes... What? I want to take a picture of my phone this time. Oh. Uh, sometimes being publicly exposed to reproach, reproach, reproach and affliction, and sometimes being partners with those so treated. And then down in uh, chapter 13, verse 2, it says, uh, Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unaware. Keep in mind, he's talking to the church as a whole. He's not talking to leaders. See what I mean? Yeah. Okay, just a second. Um, and so he's talking about these different things of how the how the congregation is to do is supposed to do these things of service, all of them. But what we've narrowed it down to is the pastor does these things. And once again, I think when we do that, we miss the true calling of the church. We miss our purpose in life. We miss what God wants to do through us. We we miss so much, and we put a we put the pastor on an area that he's not supposed to be at. And that just makes it harder for him to do his actual job because now he's got to do his job plus your job. See what I mean? And I think that that unhealthy, um, what do you call it, dichotomy, I guess, of, of, 
of church um, evolution has caused, you know, in many ways, the church to lose its impact in, in, our, in our community and in our world. Um, especially in the more westernized, populated, you know, uh, not populated, um, uh, technologically uh, progressed places like, you know, America, uh, Western Europe, you know, those kinds of places where, where, where basically Christianity has become irrelevant to the modern person. And people always ask this question, how does this apply to me? Because it doesn't. You know, it's an outdated gospel to, preaching to people who don't exist anymore. You know what I mean? And, and I think that... Uh, that that's part of it right there. Go ahead and read your third, John. For I was very glad when brethren came and testified to your truth, that is, how you are walking in truth. I have no greater joy than this, to hear of my children walking in the truth. Beloved, you are acting faithfully in whatever you accomplish for the brethren, and especially when they are strangers. And they will have testified to your love before the church. You will do well to send them on their way in a manner worthy of God. So once again about the hospitality there, just the, the service that the, that the people were showing to one another. Excuse me. The, th the second thing is to encourage or comfort. In 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses, uh, we'll just read 3 through 4. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort who comforts us in all our afflictions so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. So basically, the, the, there's this idea here, once again, that, that the pastor is the only one who encourages us, he's the only one who comforts us, when the truth is that God pours into us so that we can pour into others. Should the pastor serve and should the pastor encourage and, and comfort? Yes. But he's not the only one who should be doing it, you know what I mean? And what we do is we miss opportunity for us to partake of ministry by being the voice that someone needs to hear. Mm -hmm. See what I mean? Um, I mean, and some of us are just so so talented um, in, in, the, in the American church generally. I'm not talking about our area here, although that's true here too. I'm just saying in the American church, there are some people who are just so talented, but their talents talents are wasted because they, they, they don't, they don't uh, you know, follow that biblical model of... of of ministry, you know, ministry is re reserved for those people who are in a position of ministry. Like, for instance, um, you know, oh, they're the Sunday school leader or they're the pastor. You know, and this is why I was talking about this a couple weeks ago with the whole pride, and this is how it kind of t how pride ties into the church situation, um, because we all have a measure of power in our lives, and it we're not judged for how much power we have, but how well we handled the power that we had. So you know what I mean? So. God, God isn't going to, when you get to heaven, he's not going to ask you, so why didn't you use your money to buy yourself a better position of power? He's not He's not going to care about that. See what I mean? He's going to judge us for the actions that we did with what we had. See what I mean? There's a big difference there. Um, another aspect here, visit, fellowship, communion. These are things, once again, that are for the pastor, but not really. Um, visiting and fellowshipping, specifically, I want to focus on, you know, when, when people in, in the... Um, in the church are sick. Who goes and visits them? Oh, it's the pastor's job. But is it though? Yeah. What about when people are in jail and they need somebody to go and minister to them? Oh, the pastor needs to do the prison visits. Does he though? So I mean, I want to kind of, I want to kind of um, encourage you guys to challenge your view of ministry. So I mean, what would happen if the church? Would go out and, and serve the community if, if if they would go and do these things rather than only expecting the pastor to. Just the same, um, I I am convinced fully that um, that the church would once again be relevant to our culture. Yes, Ben. Um, with our, our modern culture, like the, the average person can do a lot of like classical ones, like jail visiting, right? That no, no, they could still could. They just would have to do it a different way. Okay. Um, let me give you an example. I carry this little sucker around in my wallet. That is a pastor's license. That pretty much says I can get into in, into prison to minister to people. I can go into the hospital to minister to people. It's really a nice thing to do. However, not everybody is going to have that. And I also wouldn't encourage everybody to get licensed or ordained or whatever just so that they can go do ministry in their community. However, there are other ways around it. For instance, um, if you are out in the community a lot, you'll, you'll meet people a lot, and then as – People go who go, go into the hospital, into the hospital and whatnot. You'll you'll know to go talk to them. Um, also, um, throughout the course of, of time, you can just 
connect with people and now I'll give you opportunities to visit them in prison. You know what I mean? Uh, anybody can go to like a prison, for instance, mm -hmm. and, and, and meet with the people in, in a, in a what's it called, you know, a visiting hours or whatever. Anybody can do that. However, you don't have the full access that a pastor does, but you can still do it. See what I mean? And with the hospital too. Um, they're not going to let you just roam from door to door. <laughs> just clarifying that because I know that sounded like that's what I was saying. I didn't mean to say like that. They're not just going to let you roam the halls. <laughs> and but, certain places like ICU. Yeah. You won't be yeah. And that's not going to happen. However, there are other areas that you can still get access to. You know what I mean? Does that kind of make sense? So you can't have the full access that a pastor would have, or you do have some you access. You can also go to places like nursing homes. Yes. Without any yes. Kind of that's true. In fact, I know I know a lot of people who have actually um, volunteered at nursing uh, nursing centers, houses. What are they called? Facilities. Homes. Yeah. Nursing homes. Yeah. Uh, I got lost there. I was like, what am I calling this? Uh, who who uh, you know? And, and then they're they're technically kind of on staff, so they get you know the access and they're able to minister to people that are largely forgotten by the culture. When uh, our when our great grandpa was in Casa, right? Casa. Um, is that the was, name of the center? Yeah, Casa Arena, okay. down there in Alamo. Uh, there was a lady that she didn't work there or that, but she volunteered, and she would bring her little dog in mm -hmm. to visit with the people. Right. And she was basically treated as staff. Oh, okay. Yeah. She just volunteered her time. And she'd bring them gifts and stuff, you know, like for Christmas and yeah. stuff like that. Also, another idea I want to throw out is sometimes people do nice things for long enough that they're actually just offered a position. Like, for instance... Um, Let's say you, you make new uh, baskets for newborn babies and, and donate them to the hospital. Well, then eventually somewhere down the line, someone at the hospital might say, hey, why don't you just set up a booth here? See what I mean? You know what I mean? And, and you never know if you don't rub shoulders, if you don't get out into the community, if you don't talk to people. You know what I mean? A lot of times with our lives, and I'm not talking about you guys. I'm talking about we all struggle with this. A lot of our time, a lot of the times we just kind of want to go into our set routine and our set little little thing. And it's so comfortable there. Especially after work, we don't want to go do all this nonsense after work. You know what I mean? I have other things to do. I, you know what I mean? And so we just kind of get this this me focus. And, and I'm not saying that, that any me time is a sin. I'm not trying to say that kind of nonsense. But I'm just saying that sometimes we just get a little bit, our priorities confused. I guess that's what I'm trying to say. But anyways, um, and uh, communion, I do I do want to I do want to clarify that because I, I don't necessarily think that everybody should be out offering communion to people. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about something that the church does as a whole. Okay. <laughs> um, it, it, it only occurred to me just now that that looks like something that, hey, you should go take communion to hey, me. I'm not, not saying that. <laughs> I'm definitely not saying that. Um, in fact, I'm of the opinion that unless you're in church leadership, you shouldn't do that. Yeah. Anyways, Acts two chapter uh, Acts chapter two verse forty two. I just turned from away from here. For goodness sake, I have to turn back. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teachings and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. This is something that all the church was doing. So let me kind of break that down again. Um, the apostles' teachings, so the preaching from the word, the fellowship, so like you know, being together, communion, um, community, I should say, not communion. Um, breaking of bread and the prayers. The breaking of bread is the communion. That, that's what we call communion nowadays. Um, and then uh, and the prayers. So once again, just a wider, wider thing than, than people are kind of used to. Used in the spirit, this is something that, that is definitely for the whole church. A lot of times um, people kind of get an idea, oh, that's the person who gives the words on Sunday. And then that person preaches and that person leads worship. You know what I mean? And I don't really think that... I, I think we've compartmentalized church service so much. First off, the worship leader has been exalted to a place that they shouldn't even be there. The only reason why the worship team exists is to guide the process of worship. They're, but nowadays, they're getting all kinds of worship and, gl and glory for the service that they do. If they have a good voice, if they don't have a good vo voice, if they're skilled in their instrument... When that doesn't even matter. The only reason why, I worship, why the worship team exists is for the purpose of guiding people as they corporately worship God. So it's not chaotic. That's the reason for it. You know, once again, I think we need to rethink this because now it's like the worship leader. You know, ah, it's a Chris Tomlin. You know what I mean? That kind of stuff. 
Um, and then, you know, there's um, the, the pastor who, one, who's one, once again, is so exalted. But one thing I want to throw, you out, throw out at you is, is at this time, there weren't a bunch of different churches. There was one church per city. And then they they saw themselves as one church globally. This is just our, our group here because, you know, you can't get all the cities of the world to unite for church every, you know, however often they met. And they didn't, you know, just meet on one day. They met on on however much they could. Um, and all and for those churches, they wouldn't just have one pastor. See, they would have pastors per church because cities were kind of large. The church was growing kind of rapidly. If you just have one pastor, that's a lot of work for one pastor to do, you know. Um, and so that kind of changes. Kind of how things were, how things operated. But anyways, going back to this using the spirit thing, First Corinthians fourteen one. Pursue love and earnestly desire the spiritual gifts, especially that you may prophesy. And he goes on through there uh, talking more. So uh, if you want to know know more about what he says, just read First Corinthians twelve thirteen fourteen. Uh, Joel, um, which is actually quoted by Peter, and I actually talked about it on Sunday night. If you guys were there on Sunday night, you heard me talk about this. Um, There. <laughs> Tiny little books. I can never find them. Joel chapter 2, verse 28 through 29. And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. And your young men shall see visions. Even on the male and female servants, in those days I will pour out my spirit. And the idea here is that everyone would taste of the Holy Spirit. You know, I, I think that's kind of been lost. Um, that that God wants us to be led by the Spirit. He wants us to be spirit led, you know. And we can't be spirit led if we're saying that person is the person who does that. And I'm not saying everybody's going to end up prophesying in the church. I'm not saying that everybody's going to be using different gifts. You know, some some people will be filled with the Holy Spirit and not be using any gifts. However, God still wants to use us. He still wants to work in us. He still wants to guide us. Um, and that's something that's true of, of what what the Bible mentions for the whole church, not just for certain people of the church. Acts chapter 6, verse 3. Therefore, brothers, pick out from among you seven men of good repute, full of the Spirit and of wisdom. Hey, they're picking out uh, the, what are they called? Um, deacons, elders, whatever you want to call them. Um, and one of the things that they specifically look for here. Right there in verse 3 of chapter 6 of Acts. Um, pick out from among you seven men of good repute, okay, good, good reputation, full of the spirit and of wisdom. You know, that, that was one of the things that they were looking for there. Uh, and I honestly think that the Bible continually shows that true church leadership cannot happen apart from the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. You're, you're going to get sidetracked without that. You know, it, it's something that, that, that leaders and the church, too need a constant focus on that. It needs to be a constant priority in their life because when we start saying, you know, the Holy Spirit isn't needed because of this, that, and the other thing, we start saying, God, you're going to work by my rules and I don't like my schedule to get messed up. Messed up. So this is how we're going to do this. See what I mean? And I think that's kind of a dangerous area to do and I think some people don't do it intentionally. I don't want to scare people away so we're just going to not really... I don't want to, uh, you know, I, I want to focus more on, more on Jesus. Well, here's the thing about that. To preach Jesus without preaching the Holy Spirit isn't to teach Jesus. That's just how it is. That That's saying one person of the Trinity can be removed from the others. It's just not true. It's just not true. Um, and in fact, this this is strongly emphasized in the Gospels. John uh, John writes down Jesus is teaching these different things, and he says, "And then I'm going to send the Holy Spirit. He's going to He's going to guide you through the process. He's going to be your helper when I'm gone." And then Luke also, "Hey, go to Jerusalem. Wait there. The Holy Spirit's going to empower you, and then I'm gonna, I'm going to use you then." See what I mean? So then to remove the Holy Spirit from the equation, I don't think is is really meeting what the gospel actually teaches. Uh oh.
So elders and deacons are meant to help the pastors in the more practical aspects. Um, pastors were not supposed to be entertainers. I already mentioned that. So people often ask, well, what about elders? What is their role? Their role is to help the pastors with the practical aspects. Um, I believe – I'm not positive about this, but I believe that the original title was – was, uh, uh, table server or something like that. I, I don't remember. You'd have to ask Dad. He's the one who's actually studied this. Um, but basically, the idea there is that the pastors were handling the other things, like you know, uh, the teaching of the word, keeping out false doctrines, um, you know, staying in prayer to make sure that they they were on the same page with God. You know, all these those kinds of things overseeing the operation, and that the elders were supposed to um, help in those practical aspects. You know, like for instance, distri distri distributing the food. Um, in Acts chapter 6, where the pastors were saying, look, we don't have time. It's not fair that we had set aside the teaching of the word to take care of this. Let's appoint seven seven men full of the Holy Spirit of good reputation and wisdom, and they'll take care of it. See what I mean? That, that, that's, that's, that's the idea of it. But what's happened in, in nowadays is, once again, off balance. We have church boards that are running the church and running the pastor out of there. Well, whereas when a Church is in a time of um, change where the pastor is stepping down and a new pastor is coming up. That is the board's job to, to take care of that process. But it's important that once a pastor is selected, unless there's some immorality, that they are able to change with the change of direction. Because different pastors are going to change the direction. I think this is another reason that, that having denominations has really screwed up the church. Because once again, there wasn't ever supposed to be just one pastor over the church. It was a group of pastors, you know what I mean? And so they had this whole process. One pastor would step out, another would step You wouldn't have that problem. But now, because all the different denominations have to have their different church in every different community, now you've got 20 different churches and none of them get along. And, see what I mean? And so then every time that one of them loses a pastor, their board has to step up and do something that they shouldn't have had to do anyways, just so that they can cover until another pastor comes, and they have to vent the pastor, and then sometimes they don't want to give up the authority. So what I mean? You have this whole process that's just ugly, ugly, ugly that it was never supposed to be. But nevertheless, I digress, and that's how it is. Um, so what are some common excuses for leaving church that you've heard? Reasons that somebody said that they left the church or are going to. visit me in the hospital. Yeah? Yeah. Ouch. Being offended. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I heard excuses of telling that it, they don't dress right for the church. The pastor didn't dress right, or the person? The person. Oh, okay. And they were run off. Right. Oh, okay. I've heard that they just weren't comfortable. Mm-hmm. Okay, like, you mean, like, spiritually, or, or, or they just didn't well, feel like just, they were welcome? They didn't feel welcome. Okay. Okay. Or even that they didn't even like the pastor, the way the pastor teaches. Okay. I've actually heard that one a lot. <laughs> the one I'm more familiar with, though, is that worship leader. Jeez, you need to get somebody else. <laughs> yeah, I've heard that, too. <laughs> yeah, the worship team. It's bad when you hear it about yourself, though. You're like... <laughs> well, I, mean, it, it, I know this one's kind of strange, but I've heard it. Oh, they use different instruments. Oh, no, actually, I am familiar with that. I've heard that one a lot. Oh, you're not supposed to use those instruments. Um, God didn't sanctify that. <laughs> where the person came to the pastor with a dispute, and the pastor didn't do what they wanted them to do. Oh, Okay. So not necessarily the pastor did something wrong, just something that they didn't like. Right. Okay. Imagine that. People not wanting to submit to somebody else's authority. Mm -hmm. Say it ain't so. Gossip. Yeah? Yeah? Yeah. Sometimes you die as a martyr in, in, in the church world and something's profited. And then sometimes you die as a martyr and nothing's profited. I'll give you an example. I was at this one church and all kinds of rumors got going on about me. I don't even know why they started it. I don't know. Whatever. And, uh, you know, people had this idea that I was just this bad person. But I stayed and I endured it to no avail. My staying didn't change a single thing. 
And uh, by the time that I finally left, all the people who, who were there at the time of the gossip, they were gone anyways, but my reputation was still shattered, you know. And uh, so, you know, I, I died as a martyr for no reason. You know what I mean? But at least I did what was right, but still the church wasn't changed. Um, in fact, they were more bitter when I left than before I left. It was just a bad situation all around. Um, what's bad is once the, once, the, uh, once the church leadership starts getting a bad attitude, it's very hard, very hard to get the attitude out of the church. One of the reasons why we really need to keep our, pa keep our pastors in prayer is because of the idea that that once once leadership starts getting a bad attitude, I'm not just talking about pastors. I'm talking about elders too. Once bad ad attitudes get in there, it's very hard to get it out of the church. Very difficult. Um, but anyways, did anybody else have some ideas before I plow through? Misunderstandings. Okay, like like could you elaborate a little bit on, on what um, you mean by misunderstanding? Yeah, it happened one time. Um, a pastor asked somebody to do something, and they. Uh, this person thought that why did they ask me to do this and not somebody else and it was a pretty simple thing that no I just asked you to do this that's all and got offended like why me yeah you know mm -hmm. so per the person they just like forget it I'm yeah it. so they just laughed <laughs> like okay <laughs> okay <laughs> um someone coming up um, another member of the church coming up to them and um, saying they couldn't wear certain clothes. Yeah. Yeah, I've seen that one a lot. Uh, another one is someone comes in and they think that they should hold some position at the church. Or the gym, mm. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you, just, you say no, and yeah. they don't like that. Yeah. One last one. Oh, boy. So many of these things are, are, are bringing back memories. Yeah? Um, a new person coming in and either the pastor or a leadership um, rushing them to get into a leadership position. Ah, uh, to try and get them to stay? Yeah. I gotcha. So some of the things that I thought of, I'm not being fed. Spiritually speaking, this one always confuses me because it, it, it's usually coming from people who obviously have uh, attitude problems, you know, and, and I'm not necessarily saying that you should never leave if your church isn't feeding you. That's not what I'm saying at all. But I am of this idea, feed others. You know, if, if you feel like you're so spiritually mature, then use that to, to the benefit the whole the whole church, you know what I mean? Um, obviously, there are exceptions where I, I wouldn't say this, but a lot of times... You know, it's just I'm so much more spiritual than the pastor. I'm so much more spiritual than everybody else, and you know, I'm just wasting my efforts and my, you know, uh, my blessings on 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 these people. You know what I mean? And uh, when it's that kind of attitude, it's like, uh, <laughs> you should definitely stay at least until your attitude changes. <laughs> but just throwing that out there. Um, I don't like the pastor. Someone there. This was actually mentioned. Um, and every pastor is different. So, I mean, it's hard to kind of answer some of these questions. It's kind of a situation-by-situation situation thing. But one thing that always applies is this, get over it. And I don't mean that in a rude way, like, oh, just get over yourself. I mean it in, like, a genuinely heartfelt way. Try and get over that. You know what I mean? Um, when you have this idea that, you know, I just I just don't like them. It's like if, if you keep doing things your life your life or not doing things in your life just because you like or don't like somebody you're never going to grow as a person you're never going to grow as a christian and you're going to have a very limited focus on who you can minister to so i mean that in, in the nicest way honestly try and get over it you know i I'm, I'm really don't mean that in, in a rude way um you aren't there for the pastor or the people you know what i mean oh well this pastor entertains me so i, I go to that church you don't go to a church because the pastor you know what I mean? because the pastor is something above and beyond I, that just made me think of something. Some people will also say that they leave. Oh, the pastor switched. They changed the what? pastors. Oh, oh my gosh, yes. I had that in my notes, and I took it out. Since you brought it up, I'm going to go ahead and plow through this. Every pastor is different, and you can never be on that quest to find that perfect pastor. Even if you had that perfect pastor you know, in years past, it's called the good old days. Every pastor is different. You're never going to find him again. Even if he is still alive and you find him again, he will have changed. 
Because people people change, you know what I mean? Like that's just how it is. But what we do is we get in our heads the, the golden age, right? You see older people do this all with a certain time frame of, of American history, you know, the golden age. And basically what happens is we have a really good time at a certain time in our life and we always look back at that time in our life and always compare everything to that. And what it causes us to do is we never really enjoy our life because we're always comparing it to something that was. And then we sugarcoat the way that the history that we remember it and make it out to be way better than it ever actually That's what was. I was say. There was all the crap. Right. Like, damn, you just we just having a good time back then. <laughs> right. <laughs> and what happens is, is we miss something you, you miss your, your happiness now. And you miss your ministry now, and you and you miss, you know, what this new pastor could teach you because he's not the old pastor. Well, church directions change, church pastors change. It's just the way it goes. I mean, you don't have to like it, but that's still how it is. Um, I've been hurt. We talked about this a couple weeks ago, and that and really the idea here that I want to leave with you is forgive. You know, you're always going to be hurt in any pa any church you're in. You're going to be hurt if you don't even go to church. Okay, you, it, being hurt is just a part of life. But forgiveness is something that has to be a part of you. You know what I mean? Uh, we were talking about this um, with the mar with the part in lust where we were talking about marriage. You don't continue to forgive your spouse because they deserve it. You continue to, to forgive your spouse because that's who you are. You're choosing to be a forgiving person. It's the exact same thing with church. You choose to be a forgiving person rather than being that bitter old person that, that, that grabs about everything. Do you know what I mean? When you're 50 or 60, you want people coming to you for advice, or do you want people staying away from you because you're always telling them all these things that you hate? See what I mean? Like, who do you want to be? Then make that who you are today. See what I mean? So, um, next up, what biblical reasons can you think of to leave a church? Good reasons. Things that you think the Bible would actually be on your side about leaving a church. Okay? If they're teaching things that go against the Word. Okay. Very good answer. We talked about that quite a bit last year. What now? If you move. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that would be a good reason. To... <laughs> I live in New York, but I drive every week to California to go to church. <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> um, if God calls you somewhere else. Okay. Like, what do you mean? Um, well, um, like uh, Jalen and... And Chris, okay. God called them to go plant a church in Las Cruces. Good point. Very good. Any other ideas? If your church shuts down. <laughs> <laughs> Can't very well go if they lock the doors. <laughs> That's funny. If there's a lot of negativity in the church. Okay, what do you mean? Like gossip, rumors, just negative people okay. in general. Okay, but don't you think that you could be a good influence on those people? True. I, I'm just throwing good ideas here. Right. You can disagree with me. I'm, I'm right. just throwing good ideas. Because a lot of times in those kind of situations, you got a bunch of grumpy people. you got one good person. It really makes yeah. a difference, you know? But it also depends on the size of the church, too. Yeah, and yeah, it the does. Church orders to do that. Yeah. I think it depends on the person as well. Yeah. If they're easily influenced. We're all easily influenced. The question is how easily influenced. Right. <laughs> and then also, I think, um, if they're spending a lot of time in prayer as well. Okay. Because if you're spending more time in prayer, you're more um, able to, you know, I I kind of agree with what you guys are saying, but I would I would conclude it with this. Let the final decision be made in prayer right. to stay or to go, whatever situation it is. And, and you know, I, I, would, I would say that before you make the final decision, prayer should always be that step. And I would say this. Don't go to prayer until you feel confirmed in what you have decided to do. Go to prayer until you feel the Lord tell you to do something. Mm. See the difference? One says, I want to leave this church. I'm going to pray until I feel like God's letting me leave, he's, until he's releasing the bond. It doesn't really work like that. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> you need right. to pray until God God tells you very specifically, you leave. See what I mean? Yeah. Then that's that's different. Now that's my opinion once again. So if you guys have differing opinions, that's totally okay. Just want to throw my hat in the ring, okay? One thing that I would say though, if a pastor uh, dies or or leaves and your church is in the moment of of looking for a new pastor, I would strongly encourage 
that you stay connected to that church um, because you need each other and a good pastor getting voted in is going to depend on you too. See what I mean? The church has, should be in prayer about that time. A lot of times people kind of get, there's no direction, everything's crazy, I'm just going to go find another church. That's an easier solution, and I think that you're totally justified in that solution. I just would encourage you personally not to do it. Because I think that the church as a whole would really uh, benefit from your saying. My own opinion, once again, that I don't have a, a scripture to back that up. It's just my own piece of advice. Um, so just some ideas that I came up with. Immorality and leadership. Uh, Chuck already mentioned this. Um, not not disagreements with leadership. Okay, Immorality and leadership. That means sinfulness in leadership. Okay, They're, they're, they're gossipers or backbiters. They are um, not teaching you know, biblical doctrine. Those kinds of things. Immorality. Not, I don't like the way that they're doing things. There's a difference, and I do want to establish that. Um, Moving. I meant it as a joke, but Gracie said it as an actual answer, so now I'm actually glad I put it in there. Um, unbiblical teaching goes along right hand in hand with immorality and and, uh, and leadership. I think those two are, are inseparable. Um, a lot of times, like okay, there's this there's this pastor who. It's in recent news, so I'm not really going to elaborate too much. But he got caught for doing some things, and uh, one of the things that he said was that he felt like the church um, uh, w didn't show enough grace in it. Well, of course he felt like that because he was living a, 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 a he was living an immoral lifestyle, and so of course he's going to twist uh, twist the scripture to back up his decision. See what I mean? Like <laughs> you were living in immorality, and you you wish that the church would have let you what stay there. What are you thinking here, buddy? <laughs> yeah, I don't know what his thinking was, but anyways, should a pastor be disciplined? What are you guys thinking? I'm not talking about discipline with a paddle and a belt and all that nonsense. I'm talking about church discipline, um, Ben. Yes, but I think by the right authority. For instance? For instance, um, well, say um, Pastor Randy messed up. Well, the district should, should correct him, not the church. And actually, I think in the AG that the district does handle those situations. I, I believe that... An Doesn't AG pastor. Don't try sometimes. Right, right, um, right. Yeah. Yeah, I think you're right. I'm not positive about that though. I think it should be for the right reasons as well, instead okay. of getting the pastor on every little thing. Okay. Just take the ones that really need to be disciplined on something. Okay. So, uh, can you give me some examples? Yes, discipline, no discipline. Like, yes, discipline would be, you know, the immoral teaching. Okay. The teaching of the wrong doctrine. Uh -huh. Stuff like that. But stuff that I would say wouldn't be disciplined is, oh, they told this personally for a valid reason. Okay. Okay. That um, makes sense. One of the, no, I think that makes perfect sense. Did everybody understand what you're saying? Uh, one of the things that I've heard growing up is they take uh, 1 Timothy and Titus where it talks about you know the qualifications for for a pastor and if a pastor messes up on the slightest bit on 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 those either of those two lists they think that that's grounds for them to leave and it's like here's the thing pastor's a person nobody's gonna totally meet everything that's the first thing and then the second thing that's that's really the biggest thing about it is. But then the other thing is this. The New Testament is not a new Old Testament. Right. It doesn't give a new set of thou shalt do this. Okay. Those lists are not exhaustive. Paul doesn't mention everything that a pastor should have, nor does he, you know, you see what I mean? Compare the two lists and you'll see that they're different to each other. He's saying this is the kind of a person that you should look for as a pastor. Just the idea of a pastor, you know what I mean? There's some other things nowadays that, that, that you know, would probably be on the list that wouldn't have been on the list back then. Or if you would have looked at the church 80 years ago, they would have said something, something along the lines of this. He has to wear uh, dress pants and a tie every week, yeah. and uh, every day in between the week, too. And he's got to never have any tattoos or piercings. And he's got to, you know to keep his hair short. He's got to keep his hair short. Because some things in the church are just fad, see what I mean? But what Paul is talking about isn't necessarily a fad or not a fad. He's talking about the kind of a person. 
broadly, generally speaking. That means your pastor is not going to be perfect on everything on this list. He's going to have some character traits that are good that are not on the list at all. Do you know what I mean? That's just how it is. Or here's another example. You've got a pastor and uh, one of their four children decides to be um, uh, rebellious and so they get kicked out of the house or something like that, right? And so then the pastor is disqualified from ministry. It's like, well, not quite. You know what I mean? It's more complicated than that. But anyways, um, I just kind of hijacked that conversation. Going back to you guys, do you guys have any more ideas about a pastor being disciplined? Ben, what are you smiling about, bud? Would you care to share with the rest of the class? <laughs> Have you guys seen uh, The Man Who Knew Too Little with uh, Bill Murray? No? Okay, well then I, my jokes would be lost and recorded at the same time, so I'm just going <laughs> to move on. <laughs> okay, so some of these things you guys already touched on from, from moral issues. Why I say only for moral issues? Because if something's not a big deal, a lot of times you just have to show the pastor grace as he shows you grace. So I mean, and it just as God has shown you grace, you know, it's just kind of like a give and a take kind of thing. Um, we shouldn't hop to hop to instantly, you know, ah, stone this pastor. This pastor publicly endorsed Clinton or Trump or whatever. They should be kicked out of ministry. It's like, whoa, guys, calm down. I don't think that has anything to do with the gospel. They were just giving their opinion on who you should vote for. Okay, calm down. <laughs> See what I mean? Some things like this, like, well, that's not really a moral issue. Um, only confirmed events. Uh, 1 Timothy 5, 19 through 20. I'm just going to go ahead and read it. Because a lot of times people will say something and we just kind of hop on the bandwagon of, oh, that happened? Um, I'll give you an example. Bill Gothard was, was a Christian teacher, real popular, you know, 20 years ago. Um, and he got accused of something by a woman who is not very mentally stable, didn't have any witnesses to the occasion, but then a bunch of other people just started hopping on the bandwagon and accusing him of it. None of these events had people witnessing of it, none of these, nothing. The only thing is, there was, the only thing that, that, that they actually had going is that there was a lot of people who came against him. I think it was 20 different women, 20 or 30 wow. different women. So that was incriminating. However, in each of those uh, situations, it could have been explained. You know what I mean? They were they were children of troubled families. A lot of times, drugs was involved. Drugs were involved. Uh, they came from you know an abusive uh, household kind of situation, that kind of stuff. You know, and, and so then for that kind of a situation, if you lay your hand on somebody's arm during counseling, that could be perceived as something bad, yeah. even though you don't mean anything by it. Do you know what I mean? So without any confirmation on it, are you? See what I mean? But instantly he's thrown under the bus because there's a possibility of it. But look what First Timothy says. And, and I do want to kind of, as I read this, give a word of warning too. Because sometimes when there's like, for instance, rape or something, we don't take it seriously enough. Okay? So I do want to say, you know, this is where the Holy Spirit definitely comes in as a great help. And where situations should be handled immediately, with discretion, and by people who are not going to benefit from it. The whole thing with Mark Driscoll that happened at the Marshall Church handled very poorly, very poorly. Could have been handled way better, and could have been could have been resolved, and Mark Driscoll's reputation could have been restored if that is in fact what happened. But at this point, nobody really knows what happened because there wasn't a good enough investigation done, and everybody was just kind of fleeing in the midst of the battle. And now you've got Mark Driscoll out there who just looks like a jerk because he didn't go. Uh, you know, the whole thing was just messy. Yeah. So I mean, when that didn't have to happen. So once again, you know, anyways, uh, 519 through 20. Um, do not admit a charge against an elder except on the evidence of two or three witnesses. As for those who persist in sin, rebuke them in the presence of all so that the rest may stand in fear. So there's two things that are that are, that are are important here. First off, don't hop to, to judgment of somebody, okay? Especially church leadership, do not hop to immediate... Um, to immediate judge, judgment, okay? If there's good reason to, to believe it, then we go to step number two. It should be handled uh, in the, it says very specifically, in the presence of all. What does that mean? It means that it shouldn't be a hidden matter. It should be a public matter. This is what this is what happened. They are, they are hereby removed from leadership. So, I mean, and so that always leads us to this question right here. I don't want to draw shame to God's name, and if, and if our leadership is, is accused of something, that might 
Disserv to not do this is a disservice to God foremost because he told us to do it. Secondly, it's a disservice to the church because they don't know what actually happened and there's no there's no benefit to the other leaders either. See, nothing has been profited by their by their mistake. It was just something where they messed up and now everybody's suffering from it. Whereas it could have been learned and used as a learning op opportunity opportunity where uh, where this this one leader's mistake would have caused other leaders to not mess up. Oh, I'll get caught. I need to make sure not, that there's safeguards in place. See what I mean? A lot of times these megachurch pastors and stuff, they have no accountability. Yeah. Uh, there was a pastor back several years ago now. Um, he, he was doing revivals and stuff, and he, uh, he was sleeping with one of the staff members. Yeah. And... Uh, that was a messy situation, huh? <laughs> it, it got messy, but... He, they came out, they confirmed, you know, this is what he's done, this is, and what they did was they took him out of ministry for two years, and they counseled him, mm -hmm. stuff like that. Um, I don't think his marriage got restored. Um, I think his wife did file for divorce, but um, then after, you know, several years, he was able to go back in the ministry. Yeah, and usually a lot of times uh, denominations and stuff will will look at the people and they'll kind of do a system based off of that. You know, off of well, do they seem repentant? Did they get caught or did they admit to it? Yeah. So I mean, just different things like that, and they'll do these little checks, and then de you know, depending on the kind of person, they'll just go once again case by case, and sometimes they'll end up back in ministry, and sometimes they'll say, "That's it." Uh, Jim Jones is a great example of this, where the AG just said no. That's it. You're 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 out. You know he didn't necessarily do anything immoral, so per se he was just doing a lot of weird things and unbiblical things. And the AG was just like, we're washing our hands of this. Good call. <laughs> Good call, AG. Good, Good call. call. <laughs> so, uh, pastors do not have absolute power. There is there is um, some there are some churches who have it where the pastor has literally absolute power. You cannot move unless y he approves of it. You cannot get a different job unless he approves it. Whoa. Yeah. Whoa. Okay, once again, I want to refer you back to that whole definition of pastor. Overseer, Overseer. and shepherd, okay? Not dictator. Not dictator, exactly. <laughs> your, your life decisions are your own. However, a pastor should always be there to offer counseling should you want it. Yeah. Not to demand obedience. <laughs> See what I mean? There's a big difference. And that leads us to the second point that I'm trying to say here. He is under God. Okay? The church is under the pastor. However, the pastor, what if the pastor does something wrong? The pastor, if he is doing something wrong, is under the authority of God, in which case God himself will bring, will bring him to judgment. You don't have to worry about that. So, I mean, God's got it covered. Once again, though, if, if something uh, immoral is going on, obviously that should be addressed. I'm not trying to excuse immoral behavior. Okay, so... Uh, pastors must not abuse their power, even if you have the the power to do something. And this doesn't go for pastors; this goes for everybody. Even if you have the power to do something, doesn't mean you should do something. Okay. A lot of times, as a parent, for instance, you have the ability and the power to bring great wrath upon your child, but it's not always the best course of action. See what I mean? In fact, I was reading this thing today where this guy was trying to argue that if Christian families were just harder on their kids and, and had more rigid rules that they wouldn't get into as much trouble. Except, nope, a lot of people, a lot of Christian kids get so overwhelmed by the rules. <laughs> exactly, get so overwhelmed by the rules that they go to the exact. You know, you've got the whole Deadpool and Captain America thing going on. You know what I mean? <laughs> uh, uh, did you hear? Did I, I don't know if I told you guys about that. On Facebook, there was this thing that said the the two kinds of pastors' kids, and it showed a picture of Deadpool, you know, because he's vulgar, he's he's violent and all that stuff, and it showed Captain America, who's you know the, the righteous one, who's always like, but what about the people? <laughs> you know. <laughs> uh, anyways, um, so never abuse your power. That just that just goes with, with anything, though. Um, and we're going to stop it there, and we'll pick up um, on this. So this will be the question for this week. What is the church? And then uh, I want you guys to really brainstorm. And, and also along the idea of what is the church, I don't want you guys to see this. Also the idea – hold on. This is a second. Along the lines of what is the church – hold on. 
what defines the church? Not just what is the church, you know what I mean? But what defines the church? As you, you as, as, as a church member, what, what makes you part of the church? You know what I mean? And I just want you guys to, to, to toy around with that idea. Um, and then we'll talk about church discipline as well next week. Um, and how to handle problems as you encounter them. Any questions?